Welcome back to the Bone Physiology Playlist. In this video, we're going to go over a, a different process than we looked at in the last video, which was endochondral ossification. This one's going to be devoted to a different kind of ossification, and this one is called intra intramembranous ossification. Okay. This type of ossification does not require cartilage. If you think back to the last video, when we did endochondral ossification, we started with something called a cartilage model. Okay, That was laid down by chondrocytes, and it was hyaline cartilage. Now, this type of process is going to get us to the same point. So keep in mind what we started with in the last video. We started with hyaline, we started with hyaline cartilage, right? In this, we're just going to simply start with an ossification center. So this is going to start with an ossification center. And then we're going to essentially ultimately get to the same point. And the same point is a bone, a functional mature bone. Now, in endochondral ossification, we did have cartilage. But also keep in mind what bones we were talking about. Okay, If we're talking about endochondral ossification, we were talking about all the bones beneath the skull with the exception of the clavicle. So you could imagine that if we're talking about intramembranous ossification, we could be talking about the bones of the skull. Okay, and we'd also include the clavicle in that list. Okay, And certainly there are many bones of the skull, the flat bones. The flat bones, which essentially um, end up being fused together with sutures, um, those are going to be formed by intramembranous ossification. The clavicle is, and so forth. Okay, But the end result is getting to the exact same point, a fully functional mature bone, except we're going to do it in different ways. Now, very similarly to the way we started uh, the endochondral ossification, we're going to have cells referred to as osteoblasts. And just keep in mind, these were the bones that are going to, or these are the cells that are going to synthesize the extracellular matrix of bones. That is the the collagen fibers. They're going to make the hydroxyapatite, right? Things we talked about in osteoblast physiology video. Okay. And what's going to happen is you're going to get these osteoblasts that are surrounded by blood capillaries, and they're going to end up in this sort of very general region alongside the collagen fibers, and it's called the ossification center. And there's a bunch of osteoblasts that kind of congregate there in what we call the ossification center. And so what's going to happen here, if you notice, we're going this direction. We're going to step two right here. Once we get the ossification center, we're going to get the osteoblast secreting organic extracellular matrix. So you're going to get the formation of these collagen fibers right here. Okay. And then what's going to happen in the second step is the calcification. So the first step, number one, we're just getting the collagen fibers. But in this step two, we're actually getting what we talked about previously. We're getting the hydroxyapatite hydroxyapatite, which is the calcified component of the bone. And notice what happens with the osteoblasts. Okay, The osteoblasts, you could sort of think of them as secreting bone matrix, particularly the, the um, calcified component, the hydroxyapatite, and they start secreting more and more and more hydroxyapatite. If you think back to our video on endochondral ossification, remember that the, the calcified component of the matrix is impermeable to nutrients. Okay, So you could imagine that I have some kind of osteoblast right here, right? And it's making essentially more and more layers of hydroxyapatite around it. And you know, I think then you realize that there's you know some blood vessels out here, but the idea is that these nutrients from the blood vessels can only diffuse so far. And so what ends up happening is the osteoblast that's in the center of what will essentially become the osteon, we'll talk about that in another video, this will become the osteon, the osteoblast is not getting very much nutrients because the hydroxyapatite is impermeable to those nutrients. And so the end result is the osteoblast becoming drastically lower in activity because its metabolism has to go down. So the osteoblast has a sharply lowered 
metabolic rate or a lower metabolism because it's not getting as much nutrients. And so what we say is the osteoblast is going to do one more differ differentiation. Okay, it's going to do one more transformation in, in which it becomes a cell, do this in orange, it becomes something called an osteocyte. The osteocytes are sort of the, I guess you could say the final product of cells for bone. Um, it's definitely less metabolically active, although it still has some activities. But compared to the osteoblast, it's basically not really negligible, but it's certainly a lot less metabolically active than the osteoblast. And it's really there just for maintenance of the bone tissue. The osteoblast, however, um, some of them that are in the center of the, um, the synthesis of the hydroxyapatite, they turn into osteocytes because they're not getting as much nutrients. But then on the outside, notice here, on the outside, I have these osteoblasts. And the reason they're still osteoblasts is because they haven't made all that extracellular matrix around them. So the blood vessels are still able to get nutrients to those guys. So they're, they're not yet separated from the blood vessels as much. But I think you have the intuition that they're going to start making more and more extracellular matrix, more hydroxyapatite, and eventually they're going to have the same problem. They're going to deposit so much extracellular matrix around them, more calcified matrix, the hydroxyapatite, right? that the blood vessels aren't going to be able to get nutrients to those guys. And so once again, they're going to differentiate into these, which are osteocytes, the less metabolically active descendant of the osteoblast. One important distinction I want to make here, and I want to make sure you very well understand this. What we have here essentially is we have osteoprogenitor cells. So we have an osteo progenitor cell which can turn into an osteoblast and then depending on the the status metabolically of the osteoblast it can then transform into an osteocyte under uh, situations where there's low nutrients okay the osteoclast the osteoclast is not related okay remember that osteoclasts are derived from macrophages that take up residence in the bone so osteoclasts by no means are related to these three cells. They have a different precursor cell. They come from macrophages, which are immune cells. In fact, um, osteoclasts do retain some of the macrophagic activity of their ancestors. Okay, but now what we have is kind of a, a, a kind of a, a, a zoomed out picture where we're assuming a lot of time has passed. And, you know, we have all these osteoblasts that have become osteocytes because they've de been depositing hydroxyapatite all around them. And so what you're initially going to get is spongy bone. So the first type of bone that synthesized um, in intramembranous ossification is spongy bone. And because what you're doing is you're making a type of bone tissue called trabiculae. And trabiculae will essentially fuse, and trabiculae is, of course, the, the plural term, trabiculae will fuse into the spongy bone as a whole. Okay, so this, this kind of business in here, this is the spongy bone. And what's going to happen is from the spongy bone, the synthesis is essentially going to radiate outwards. Okay, and so you, I think you can see in here that this right here is, of course, a layer of spongy bone. You can see the trabiculae that are fused together. But if you go outward from that, let me do that in green. If you go outward, notice you have this region right here. And on the bottom, of course, you have the same region. This is called compact bone. And remember that when we looked at the formation of the long bones using endochondral ossification, we had spongy bone in the center and we had compact bone on the outside, particularly in the bone collar region of the long bones. Okay, And once again, what's happening as you get more and more bone tissue synthesis, the osteoblasts are depositing this matrix around them. And it, be it becomes so hard to get nutrients to the osteoblast that they instead go to a less metabolically active de descendant called an osteocyte. And that just basically is going to help maintain the bone tissue with some activities that we won't go into here. Okay. And once again, you know, we also have these osteoblasts that are on the outside. I think you can see them right here. So these particular osteoblasts have not yet 
uh, calcified their environment around them. And so they're still very metabolically active because they can actually get nutrients from the blood vessels that surround the periosteum. And hopefully this, this, this uh, system called intramembranous ossification makes a little bit of sense. And one thing that I can do on an exam is I can ask you to very briefly compare and contrast intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. And one of the big, big differences between the two is that intramembranous doesn't require cartilage. Okay? Endochondral ossification does, and I think you recognize the chondro in its name implies that it requires cartilage to start with, but intramembranous does not require cartilage to start with. Another main difference is the actual type of bones that they synthesize. Remember that when we used hyaline cartilage and did endochondral, we got bones that were beneath the skull. Bones that are beneath the skull, of course, with the exception of the clavicle. And if we're doing intramembranous ossification, we're getting the bones of the skull, particularly the flat bones, and then also we get the clavicle synthesized in that way. What's another difference? Well, in, in endochondral ossification, how many ossification centers did we have? Well, we actually had two ossification centers, right? Whereas in the intramembranous model, we only had one ossification center. And so those are just some differences to think about, and I'm sure you could think of some others. And there are also some similarities, right? I think at the end of both of these syntheses, we have both spongy bone that's on the interior of the bone, and then we also are going to have compact bone that lies on the outside, okay? So hopefully this makes a little bit of sense, okay? So I hope that video made sense, and in the next video, we're going to look at some other topics. See you in the next video.